Lily Farley. I live on Key Biscayne. Um, my husband, who was a neurosurgeon, practiced in Michigan, but we came down here on weekends way back in the early 80s. I have just written a book of my experiences during the war. And I joined the Air Force when I was 18. We learned very quickly how to march and a lot of things that I didn't expect to have to know. I was called a WAF, which is the female version of the RAF. I was sent away to learn how to march, get my uniform, and take all the shots that have been known to man. The war broke out in 39. I joined up in uh, 42, November of 1942. I was 18, just 18. And I was sent to Bomber Command, Fighter Command, Coastal Command, Balloon Command, and I was in London for the beginning and end of all of E1s, the doodlebugs, and for part of the time for the rockets. So I saw quite a bit. In fact, I don't think I missed a thing. I began thinking about writing the book when my children asked a lot of questions about what it was like for me growing up as a schoolgirl. And I then began telling them as much as they wanted to hear. And finally I realized that I would very much like to have a record of what had happened during those years. And the more they pushed, the more I responded. So that was how the book came to be written. Mrs. Farley has written an incredible book about her life during World War II and may be turning that book into a movie very soon. I told you I was selfish because I always look for people who inspire me. And this is a source of inspiration. Just when you think that the years add on and that there may not be anything else different that you can do, here it is, okay? And it is a source of inspiration for me and it should be a source of inspiration for you. World War II used by the military, the blimps and all of that. That event was the most defining one in, in world heritage. A little later, you're going to get per first hand from someone who experienced it. If you think about that, you should know that hundreds of British pilots, co-pilots, aviators, weather people, literally hundreds of them, trained right here. They trained at the University of Miami, in how to be navigators, bombardiers, all of that. Hundreds of them trained at Clewiston. Among them was Winston Churchill's nephew. And in the city cemetery on 8th Street are 13 of the fallen from Britain, from Australia, from New Zealand. And every year we honor them along with our own. So whatever you're going to hear after lunch, it touched this whole region. So there. <laughs> the first chapter deals with peacetime. Uh, pretty much growing up and how it felt to uh, just live in England. The war, as it's declared, and then we have to have an air raid shelter erected in the base, well, in the cellar of our house. And what it was like to get a gas mask, and, you know, you put these things on, and they 
flap around the sides and make a terrible racket that you could hardly breathe. Well, he was an air raid for the chief of our area. So he was out on the streets when the air raids are in front. And the rest of us, my mother, my sister, seven years younger, stayed in the air raid cellar. And one night we had a pretty gruesome raid. It started out, I think I've broke, written some notes here. I lay on the bed and peered out from under the eider down to focus on a tea tray that was on the far distant wall. Um, we had a tray with teacups and, you know, the usual stuff that you have. Because it would be coffee here, but there we had tea. And canned goods. And as the raid progressed, everything began to rattle like a machine gun. And we watched it for a while. Um, I couldn't help but wonder, as I lay there and looked at that, I wondered how it would be <coughs> to use the exit that we had. We had a steel lidded escape hatch that led into the back garden. But I couldn't help but think if we had a direct hit and three floors above came down on top of us, how would we get out? But anyway, like Scarlett, I'll think about that tomorrow. At the, at the height of all the racket came the surprising sound of a piano trilling the length of the keyboard. My mother, lost in thought, and unaware that no human hand had touched those keys, asked, who would even think of playing a piano at this time of night? And of course, we knew that no human hand had really touched that piano. It was the blast. But she got a weak chuckle anyway. Race continued off and on for, well, quite some time, years. And this was in 1940 when they first began. 1940. At that time, I was also going to school and I had a job caring for those people who had been rescued in the hospital. And that was quite interesting. But at 16, it was also pretty devastating when the airways interrupted the buses which took us to the hospital. Uh, we had to walk and it was seven miles. I decided at 18 that I needed to do something to help the war effort more than I was managing to do. So college was postponed and I was inducted into the WEF, Women's Auxiliary Air Force. And Terry just asked me, what did I do in the Air Force? Well, that's a very interesting question because there's no real definite answer, as I found out when I asked the recruiting officer. What happened was that they had just released this particular trade for women. Before that, it was only open to men. And it involved different duties depending on which station you were on. If you were on a fighter, you had to do all kinds of things, including meteorology reports to the pilots um, and fixes and so forth. Uh, there was balloon command. I had to go out on site and find out how the barrage balloons worked. And those people deserve a medal. They were out there with a winch cranking away at this great barrage balloon in all kinds of weather. It could be really sleet, 
and pouring with rain or snow and high winds, and they were still there. It was one heck of a job to get those things up in a wind. And the machinery, the crank would sometimes snap back and was known to break a wrist. So I was glad I didn't have to do anything like that. That just enabled me to know what they were going through when I was back in Ops Room issuing commands. There were all sorts of commands that I'd never heard of, and I haven't heard of them since. One was that there were towns uh, replicated by certain uh, lights um, that they were called starfish lights, so that if a town like Swansea, which was very badly bombed, if the bombers came back, they could to be sure that Black House was in force, so there'd be no light showing in the town. But in the starfish sites was a twinkling of lights here and there to represent what the town might look like if we'd been careless about blackout. It was interesting. Anyway, so that's balloon, bomber, and fighter. Um, then I was sent on a course when Hitler's secret weapon was launched, the B-1 and the B-2. And that was quite an experience. We knew that something was coming, but it took a while for us to find out how to cope with them. And of course, the rockets, there was just no solution to them. They moved faster than sound, and was, you couldn't hear anything until you heard the final explosion. And of course, how luck, they did far more damage than the B-1s. Yet they weren't as scary, because when it was over, you, you would hear just this bang, and you knew if you heard the bang, you'd survived. So, in a way, uh, the V ones were more to be feared. But I want to tell you a little bit about when I first went to have my, well, they called it foot bashing, but what it actually was, was learning how to march. And, of course, they equipped us with these terrible shoes, I thought. I wasn't used to wearing those club uppers. And, of course, we were marching all the time, and we were there for six weeks and uh, learned all of our King's regulations, which was all the rules, got all our shots. I swear that if they didn't have anything to do, they would look around and find another shot that they wanted to give us. I think we were insulated against all diseases known to man, and some of those we didn't know about. Our sergeant was a stringent taskmaster, bent on getting the last ounce out of us. Yellowy, blonde hair, pugnacious and busty, she had a voice capable of drowning out an amplified brass band, literally. In moments of exasperation, however, it flew up a notch from a low, menacing growl to the ear-splitting screech of a peacock in mating season. Generally, though, she just roared her commands with ear flapping intensity. We never saw her smile. When we passed our uh, uh, marching, well, I suppose you could call it a test. And we received an ovation from all the people watching on the beach. And I, that was the closest I ever saw her come to a smile. The frown wasn't there. The scowl had gone. 
She wore a scowl of such fierce ferocity it frightened the birds perched on overhead wires, who all took off an alarm when she bellowed. Dogs were terrified. One dog in particular, a pitiful stray mutt with his scrawny neck fully stretched, always set up a piercing, high-pitched, wavering howl as soon as he saw her coming along the seafront where we drilled. The sergeant tried ordering him quiet, but he just wailed louder, the two creating a very comical duet. It was enough to make a cat laugh, but we didn't dare. I nearly ruptured a gun trying not to. Tough as her body, she was tough as her nail boots. That is probably a good enough glimpse into what the book is about. But what was interesting that I read later was that in 1940, after Hitler conquered France, and we were, which really then included almost all of Europe, Holland, Belgium, Norway, France, Italy. So England was really sort of hanging on by its fingernails. But Hitler was so sure that England would surrender after he captured France, that he had almost all of Europe under control, that he ordered a tremendous supply of flags, bunting, swastikas, which he was going to decorate London with. Wasn't that nice? At the end of the book, there's a little chapter on the Channel Isles, which was absolutely shrouded in mystery during the war. Nothing was ever broadcast, because nobody knew. There was no way to know. When you think that one of those islands was only 12 miles off the coast of France, it's hard to think that the Germans occupied that land. I went there after the war. I did put a chapter in about that at the end because it seemed to relate. And I went there, and if you ever go to Europe, it's worth going to see what happened. They, the Germans built an underground hospital, an underground munitions factory, it was enormous. The islands were just, two of them especially, Guernsey and Jersey, were just riddled with uh, fortification. So it's well worth a look. I'm hardly believable that this could have been possible. Oh, but the Netflix has a movie which is in a lighter vein. It doesn't tell you very much except about the rationing. Everybody was so short of food that they were making things like potato peel pie. And so one night, they were caught out by the police, the, the German police, and it was after curfew. And they had to invent a reason so they said they belonged to this society, which was called the Potato Pie Peeling Society. <laughs> On that note, I'll leave you. Is there any questions? It's, it's great that you've done this book. I can't wait to read it, oh. or yet to see the movie. But your memory is so good and so detailed about everything that you seem to be remembering. Did you keep notes from years ago? I didn't, but I, as I was explaining to Terry, my children were interested at various points. You know, they'd get the history lessons at school, and so they'd ask me about my adventures. I didn't tell them all of them, but um, it just made me realize that 
that there was a lot of curiosity for the generation that had escaped the war. So I began, I made a few notes along the way. And it was, it's taken me over a year to write the book. But I did remember, I still am remembering things I haven't yet put in the book. Make sure you write them down. I will. Yes. Okay, uh, I don't know. You were the RAF Auxiliary Air Force. Yes, it is okay. RAF and WAF, the Women's Branch. Right, well, uh, then, uh, do, you, do you know anything about the two Polish? Uh, uh, oh, the Polish, yes. They were wonderful pilots. Yes. My mother was an aviation pioneer. She got her pilot's license in 1924. Her instructor was the uh, World War I fighter pilot, Floyd Bennett. So I got to meet through her some of the WAS, the American Women's Army Service Pilots. We also had the Army Air Corps Women's uh, Corps, the, uh, the WAX, uh, Women's Army uh, Corps. But um, the the, uh, the was before Pearl Harbor. Some of those women, before they became war, uh, were fly, uh, became was were flying B uh, 17s to England. What, what? We would like to hear that. Would you like to use this and tell us? It's like Jackie Hartford, uh was one of those. Jackie Hartford, she became a legend. She later entered the United States Air Force in 1947, retired as a colonel. I can't hear all of you, but you're saying, could you come up? Okay. The WASP were the Women's Army Service Pilots for the uh, American Army Air Corps. Yes. And uh, some of those, before they were formed in 1941, were flying B-17s to England. Yes. Women flying them because the Army pilots couldn't do it because the United States was neutral. Yeah. But these women were flying them. Uh, that was a separate venture. Separate venture. But uh, the, the thing is, the women in service in England went through uh, all of the hardships of everybody else, and they were the one pulling people out of the wreckage and everything. And so that's what you had to face. And some of our, our American women serving there. We had black women serving in England, and uh, uh, with the army, uh, uh, army uh, corps. And so uh, England was a great melting pot. Yes, yes, it is. Well, um, we had a recent movie on Winston Churchill, and uh, the dark days. Of World War II. But it is interesting to know that there were people who were ferrying pl uh, planes over B-17s from the States to England, and they were women, and they were very brave. Anyone else? Questions? What was your geographic location on the 7th of December, 1941? 1941, I was not in the Air Force then. I was in the air raid cellar, listening to the bombs. <laughs> very interesting to go out and see what it was like outside. Not very good. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. It's been a great pleasure. Why do you think it's so important that we talk about World War II and, and all the things that happened abroad and here? Oh, I think it's very important to talk about this. I think it's very important for people to know what happens when war isn't confined to the battleground. This was a people's war in a way that no other war that we had ever been involved in had manifested itself. We were on the front line, really. Um, you 
never knew when you went to bed if you would really be homeless in the morning. Not all cities were bombed, but those that were, we were near one that was, near Birmingham and Coventry, and both of those cities were making munitions and suffered with great loss of life and loss of housing. So it was very interesting to read about it afterwards, to read about some of the people's experiences as they were bombed out of their homes. There was one story about a couple who were very ancient and were living in a block of houses, a row house. And for some reason, there was just one section of it left standing. And as the fireman broke into this house, they found an old lady and an old man partner rocking away in the rocking chair. They didn't even know there was a raid on. They were stone deaf. They didn't know that there was no staircase to take them to bed because they had a door on the bottom of the stairs. It was, it was comical in spite of the fact that it was rather strange. When the people, when the air raid warden broke through the door with their hatchet, they were totally startled and couldn't understand and they thanked him for dropping in. <laughs> What do you hope that people take away from reading this book? What do you hope they get from that? Well, I think probably what they'll take away is the fact that war, when it hits the civilian population, is pure devastation, and we can't afford any more war.